Okay. Looks like we have started to record. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amanda Gendak, manager of the NJDOT Bureau of Research. Thank you so much for joining us for today's lunchtime tech talk webinar, which is part of a series of webinars and other events uh, sponsored by the Bureau of Research. The Tech Talk program is meant to share and promote the implementation of research and innovative practices and transfer of knowledge uh, among NGDOT staff and others within New Jersey's transportation industry. In this lunchtime Tech Talk webinar, we'll be learning more about recent and ongoing transportation research affecting New Jersey's maritime transportation system. Today's Tech Talk features presentations from Dr. Daniel Barone, and Dr. Robert Miskowitz of Rutgers University. So now I would like to introduce our moderator today, Omid Sarmad. Omid is a member of the Technology Transfer Project team, and Omid will moderate the question and answer portion of today's webinar. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the presentations. All right, thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, before we get started today, we're just gonna do a couple of housekeeping items first. Uh, Doctors Baroni and Miskowitz will speak for about 15 minutes together today. We're gonna save the question and answers for the end of the program. Uh, throughout the presentation, if you do have a question, please use the chat box marked Q&A and submit all the questions to the host. Alternatively, you can use the chat box as well. Uh, professional development credits are available if you stay for the full session. Your name must be included among those who registered. And uh, please also complete the feedback form that should pop up after the event closes. We should be finished by about 1.15 today. Uh, with those items out of the way, let's move on to today's presentation. Nearshore placement of dredge sediment is a natural nature-based strategy that can enhance an ecosystem and reduce coastal flooding, while at the same time provide a viable, cost-effective, and long-term beneficial use option for disposal of dredge materials. But improper placement of dredge materials can damage habitat or wash away, providing little or none of these benefits. Strategic placement of dredge sediment requires knowledge of site conditions and sediment transport behavior to provide ecosystem enhancement and resiliency. Today, Dr. Daniel Baroni will present preliminary findings from a nearshore sediment placement project at Good Luck Point in Berkeley Township, New Jersey. This project is being conducted in partnership with the NJDOT Office of Maritime Resources and the Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. Dr. Baroni is a jointly appointed associate professor at Rutgers University Department of Marine and Coastal Studies at the Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Transportation. We're also gonna to hear today from Dr. Robert Miskowitz, who will describe efforts underway to customize a Delft 3D morphological model to improve estimation of channel shoaling for the state's navigable waterways. Successful deployment of this model for the Shark River in New Jersey will facilitate expansion to the entire maritime transportation system and support NJDOT's efforts to improve navigability and facilitate operations and maintenance of the maritime work. Dr. Miskowitz is an assistant professor Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University, and his work with the Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Transportation relates to new methods of processing dredged materials for beneficial use. Uh, Dr. Miskowitz, I'm gonna turn it over to you first. Okay, all right, let me, um, you have to give me the share button. Yeah. Should pop up uh, right now. Okay, and you're still transcribing, you know, I do. What's interesting is each time that you hit tra that you said my name, it came up as something different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to work on that while I, while I stop sharing here. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, hello everyone. Um, again, my name is Robert Miskowitz. Um, let me get this slideshow. Looking good. Okay. Good. All right, so um, today I'm gonna to be talking about a project that Dan and I have been working on now for about a year, a little over a year. And um, we have about another year left in it. And what we are doing is we are building a um, model framework for assessing sediment transport within the state um, maritime transportation system. The Maritime transportation system is made up of state channels and federal channels. If you look at the map, 
the red indicate the um, state channel, actually. The, the red indicate the state channels, the blue indicate the federal channels. Now, there are over 300 nautical miles throughout the, the state um, of these channels, and these channels are continuously filling up with sediment. They are, you know, the, the federal channels are an unnatural um, feature that for various reasons we have created. And in order for, you know, the way that the system works is it will always go back to its equilibrium. The, 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 the dredge channels, the, the system itself doesn't want these dredge channels to be deeper than the sediment around them. So what ends up happening is they go towards an equilibrium, which means they fill up. And as they fill up, we have to dredge them more. And what this comes down to is dredging is a very large, very necessary um, operation that is undertaken by the state of New Jersey and also by the feds um, to maintain our, you know, there's all kinds of economic drivers, whether it's ports or whether it's, um, it's the smaller areas down down the shore where we have um, channels for recreational boating. Now, all of these channels are continuously filling up. And what ends up happening is we have limited resources. There are limited resources for dredging. It's not, it's not a cheap operation. It involves heavy machinery. And as you'll find out with um, Dan's talk, we have to put this mud somewhere. So my talk is going to be for us trying to figure out how to better manage the resources needed for dredging. And then when, you when, when, when Dan comes on, he'll be talking about what we can do to actually manage the dredge once we've, dr once we've taken it out. Now, where does the mud actually come from? Now, it comes from several places. Um, there is uh, sand that will come in from the ocean and will be shifted around Barnegat Bay is a very shallow bay. There is lots and lots of sediment that is always cycling around. Some of it will end up in the channels. There also will be fine grain sediments that come from upstream. Um, when it rains, we have, we, we have runoff events, we get erosion, all of that ends up in the receiving waters of the state, which is where the, these navigation channels are, and we end up getting fine sediments coming out of that. So, when you actually look at how much we do, we typically dredge around a quarter of a million cubic yards a year. Um, that is a very small amount compared to the amount of channels that we have and the amount of sediment that is actually being accumulating within these channels. That is also, those are also normal years. If you get uh, extreme events like say a Hurricane Sandy, which filled up most of the channels that we have. So there are going to be lots and lots of uh, different variables that come into how do we take these limited resources that we have and we keep the, the New Jersey Marine Transportation System running and we keep it in, you know, as a state of good repair because a lot of these channels are filling up and we don't have the money to dredge them. So the idea is let's come up with a way to allocate our resources and figure out what are the channels that need to be dredged the most, where are channels that are going to be, um, that will probably not need dredging as much, because there are going to be depositional rates that are different in many, many areas. Now, um, the New Jersey Department of Transportation, OMR, has several systems up and running. They have the dredge material management system, the waterway linear referencing system, and the maritime asset management system. These are systems that are used together to come up with an idea on what is the state of the marine transportation system? What do we have to do as far to, to bring it up to a state of good repair? What do we have to do to keep it in a state of good repair? And then once we, those, we, we actually dredge those materials, what do we do with the dredged material? Where can we put it? How can we either dispose of it or beneficially reuse it to a benefit. Now, if you look at the way that our, the, that, that we have the, um, 
the WLS system that was in the previous, the water, waterway linear referencing system. With that, we're looking at what type of um, what what is what are the actual conditions of individual channels? Now, in that and the maritime asset management system, what we do is we take the data and we pre predict what are what are the channels that we're going to need. Now, estimating of shoaling rates is a very important aspect of this. We go out, um, we have uh, measurements taken every couple of years to measure. What is this? What is the depth of these channels? How much sediment has accumulated in them over those couple of years? And what we've done historically is we created a model that predicts how much the sh how much shoaling is going to occur in each of those channels. And that model is just a simple, empirically based um, model that 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 goes towards an equilibrium depth. And all it really Basis the sedimentation rate on is what were the measured depths? How much sediment has accumulated between the different surveys that we've taken? Now, that tells us two points in time. It doesn't tell us what's happened in between those years. There may have been there may have been accretion over the longer period. We may have erosion events due to high flows. We don't know. So. In this case, it's a very, very simplistic way of looking at it, and it is based completely on two points. And, you know, obviously, if we have two points, we can always draw a line. We know it's not linear between those two points. So what we've what we're trying to do is look at this and say, OK, it is not based upon those two points. It's actually based on processes. The model that they've been using is fine it's 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 inexpensive it's uh based on data so it is it is realistic but it's very difficult to take those two points and then extrapolate outward and say okay this is what the depth is going to be in two or three years and that makes it very hard to use as a planning tool now if we can look at this in terms of a a different process based uh, model which is what we're doing and we're using the Delft 3D model. Delft is a um, it's a Dutch company, and this is a this is a uh, hydrodynamic model that is used all over the world. And they have um, a very interesting sediment transport component to it that we tested out for this aspect or for this project. Now, the goal of this project is to ultimately you develop a sediment transport um, module to be put into that MAM system that I described, but we can't go and do the entire state navigation channel system right, right off the bat. And if you look, most of our channels are actually very, um, are, are connected to each other. So what we were trying to do when we came up with this project is let's find the most isolated state channels we can find. This is Shark River. Um, Shark River is a small um, coastal impoundment, really, with a with a river coming in from upstream, and it has a small network of state channels that are maintained. This gives us a really nice closed system that we can run this model on. It's also fairly small, which allows us to manipulate it many, many ways and allows us to put our model through its paces a lot better than we otherwise could if the model was had a much larger domain. So if you look, these channels are just, just this is the bathymetric survey for the base, baseline depth of the channel system in Shark River. And what we're doing with this model is we're trying to predict sedimentation rates in these channels. Now, just so I, I don't ruin the uh, the punchline of this whole project, um, we are not done with this project. <laughs> we have we've run some preliminary uh, simulations, but we're not finished. We haven't done the full calibration, and we also have not been able to run it for a three or four year period, which is what we want to do. We're actually um, we're actually working on. Um, setting up a server to be able to run this because uh, Delft 3D is um, very intensive in its, uh, in its computer needs.
Okay, so this is this is Shark River. It has some really good uh, benefits for what we're going to be doing, being that it's a small area. We also have tide gate tide gauges in the entrance channel uh, for the inlet. We have the, uh, the the two tributaries that come in to this uh, to this body of water are both gauged by USGS. So we actually have flow and and PSS measurements, which also our inputs to our model. So we have, a re it's a very nice, nicely delineated system for us to use as a demonstration model. Ultimately though, we plan to do this for the entire state. All right, so this is our model grid. Um, you can see all these little triangles. Those are individual, um, those are individual elements and we calculate the, the water flow and depth in each one of these, um, each one of these elements. So, as you get out offshore, they get much larger, and as you get into the channels, I, I don't even think you can see them because they're small enough. Many of them are on the scale of one to two, three square meters, um, and that's because we need higher resolution near the channels. So we've actually burned those channels in with really high resolution. And as we get out onto the mudflats, you get larger and larger um, grid points because we don't need as high resolution of the flow in those areas. Okay, this is um, this is a really, really nice high resolution model. But notice we're cal we're doing calculations, multiple calculations at a time step of seconds in each one of these grid boxes. So it's computer time wise. This is this is very intensive. All right, so when we ran the model, now this model is based upon boundary conditions that are set. Now, the most, the thing that drives the flow in this model is going to be the tides. We have, if you look at the outside of this, um, you can see my cursor on here, these outside uh, boundaries, um, we have the tidal conditions on each of those three boundaries. And they are based upon, um, Astronomic tides. There's a dominant. Uh, the dominant uh, tidal period is the M2. It has a period of 12.42 hours. I think we have a total of 10 tidal components, so we can still work in the, the semi-diurnal um, variations as well. Now, we also have the flow coming in from these external gauges here and this external gauge here. These are programmed in using USGS gauges to measure flow. And what you can see, let me turn it on. Yep, there you go. The greens, yellows, and reds are much higher flow rates. And you can see the highest flow is obviously in the inlet. And as it spreads out and as it gets farther in, you get a much lower flow rates. But there's also a higher flow rate in the, in the state channels because of the depth. The areas outside of those channels, um, at low tide, some of the mud is exposed. Other areas, it's, it's very, very shallow, less than a couple of feet. Okay, so this is the, the flow model. Now, this is just showing us where the water goes. Now, what's important though is Obviously, the flow is going to determine a lot with where the sediment transport is. I'd just like to also point out, if you look up here, there's a bridge crossing. And you can see, oh, I think you can see, yeah, there it is. You can see there's an awful lot, a very high velocity coming out through this channel. That channel, it's a bridge crossing, it's constricted flow. And what's very interesting is we do get a lot of, um, we get a lot of, shear and sediment transport coming through there there's actually a, a scour hole underneath that bridge and we're able to simulate that fairly well in this in the model okay so the boundary conditions that we used oh boundary conditions that we're using these are all external data um the tidal tidal forcings and then we also have the shark river gauges this model that that I'm showing you the results from is actually a three day simulation. Um, unfortunately, uh, the computer, the, the computer needs for this model are very, very high. And 
what we're trying to do is get it set up. That's that's basically the next phase in this project is to get this up on a, a, a server system running with with several cores so we can run it a lot faster. And that way we don't have to uh, we don't have to take computers home with us and shut them down and run them overnight and stuff like that. So that's that's the next phase. And I think and we'll be starting that on on Monday. Okay, but you can see this. This area, we had a, a small uh, storm on the 1st of January in 2021. And we ended up with um, a small, a fairly small discharge. Now, this is just for the flow rate. We also have corresponding um, increases in the suspended sediments coming in as well. So we have the sediment, the sediment coming in and we can predict where does that sediment actually go. All right. so. Here are our suspended sediment predictions in the model. You can see from here, now this is suspended sediments. This is not sediment transport because a lot of the sediment transport is not necessarily suspended. A lot of it will be um, pushed and moved along the bottom. You can see in this case, really the largest amount of sediment is coming out as a, uh, a function of the the discharges from the stream from that particular stream because there was the highest amount of sediment coming in there now there is other suspended sediments that are going to be throughout this system but most of the of the the sediment that is suspending in around the inlet that's all sand and it falls right out of suspension so it moves it's it's um it's not actually getting fully suspended so only the really, really fine muds coming from upstream are what we're finding getting suspended. Now, that, again, that's only for a three day period. We may have other, um, as we go, we may have higher uh, tidal velocities that will st strip some of the mud off of the flats, but we didn't see it in this three day period. Okay. So in order to come up with sediment transport parameters, now, what I'm talking about now is not the sediment coming out of the coming in from the rivers. I'm talking about sediment redistributing throughout this water body. So we went through and we did uh, we went out and did a full sampling. We took samples at each of these pink sample locations with Ponar Grab Sampler. And from them, we took cores because when you, you can open up these uh, the Ponar Grab Sampler and you can take a, a core we used. It actually is the uh, inner lining of a geotube, or not a geotube, uh, sorry, the sleeve for a, a geoprobe. And we cut them about 10 centimeters long and we put them in, we capped them on both sides, brought them back and froze them and used them for our sediment samples. Okay, now what we ended up doing was we took different um, different measurements with them. The first measurement we took was shear, so we needed an intact surface. That's why we took those cores. We also did settling rates and we did um, we did texture. Now our texture was only limp limited to uh, coarse grain versus fine grain. Um, we basically used a 200 mesh sieve and anything that passed the 200 mesh sieve was considered um, fine, meaning clays or silts. And anything greater than or that that didn't pass was considered coarse, which we consider the sand. Okay. All right. Come on. Oh, whoa. Hold on a second. I have uh, I think I have a slide out of order. Hold okay. on a second. Yeah. Here we go. Sorry. I, I. So the sediment suspension. Now this is how does sediment actually get lifted? Now it's not necessarily becoming fully suspended. This is just sediment that is breaking the surface. Now, there are two ways that the model handles this. The first is for coarse sediments. For coarse sediments, we use the Shields diagram. If you look at that's the this, this figure on the bottom, the Shields diagram, the, the curve it indicates where the critical value of shear is. The critical value is the shear that is required to suspend a sediment. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to stay suspended. It's not enough shear to actually keep it in suspension it is just to break it off the bottom okay so you can get it bouncing and moving along the bottom 
which is not moving as suspended sediments, it's just mobilized. Now, in the Shark River, we have a lot more mud. And we have a lot of cohesive sediments. And that what happens with a cohesive sediment is the sediment doesn't act like a grain of sand. A grain of sand is easy because it's discrete. We treat each of them the same so that they can, we, we put, we have a shear going over them. If one particle can suspend, they all can too. If for soft sediments, if they're, they're, if they're cohesive, that means they're sticking together and they're not acting as an individual grain of, of soil. They're actually acting as a continuum of soil. And when you break them, what ends up happening is it breaks and it usually breaks in chunks. But once that chunk breaks, then all of a sudden the whole system starts to, to uh, disintegrate because you get currents flowing into the holes that are created and it undermines that cohesive nature. So usually when you look at a cohesive sediment, you look at it break and then it all washes away until you get a new surface developing. And that's what's shown here. This is, um, now these sediments, we tested them in what is essentially a sed flume. It's a custom made sed flume. We did it ourselves. These are, uh, these are plexiglass sheets and we have a uh, hole drilled in the bottom and we can push the sediment core up through it. We have a pump pushing water through. We have suspended sediment measurements on the, or sorry, turbidity measurements downstream. And what we ended up doing though, is we measure this. Shut Dan's voice off. Sorry, Dan. Actually, he's probably happy I'm shutting his voice off. Thank you. So, but you can see the water flowing over it. And what we do is we just gradually increase the water, the, the, the velocity. And you can see there's there's some bubbles coming off of it, but it's not breaking. Now, where is it? 33 seconds in, you'll see where it, it, it there it is. That's where it finally breaks. And you can see that's where it broke. Now, as we continue, it will continue to break. But that first break, that is considered the critical period for when it actually breaks. Because once it does that, the surface has, is the, 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 the forces that are holding that sediment together are less than they were before. So at that speed, things are going to break. So that's our critical shear value. We, 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 we know what the velocity was. We know what the, the arrangement of the channel is so we can calculate shear. And we estimate the critical shear from those measurements. And we did those for all of those different soil sediments. So we have critical shear in the model as a three-dimensional, or sorry, a two-dimensional um, layer. It's actually a GIS layer. And we put that into the model so we can measure what is the critical shear for the mud fraction and we also can do it for the sand fraction, although we didn't measure it for the sand fraction, we just used the, uh, the shields diagram. And you can see, this, these are the shear measurements. And you can see where the shear actually occurs. Obviously the highest velocity is in the inlet channel. But what's important is when you start to look down around these other channels, you can start to see pulses of shear in the channels. Now, we're not gonna get anything out on the flats, but in these channels, you're getting shear. So there, if there is shear and it gets high enough that it, that, that it reaches a critical shear value, that means that it will suspend sediments. And those sediments will travel throughout this system. Now, that's where the, the most of the shear is, but there are there is shear coming off of these especially coming off of, of here. So we can measure the erosive forces here using this. Now, once we're done with erosive forces, sorry, I'm, oh. then we have to talk about sediment transport. Now, sediment transport is, is interesting because obviously different size particles are going to settle differently. So if you look at the sediment samples that we took, we can't isolate the individual particle sizes and try to calculate a settling velocity for all of them. So we used a, a method that's actually typical. Um, it's outlined in, in wastewater treatment plant or design. It's done by Drosty in 1997. This is a, it's a simple um, cumulative distribution function versus settling velocity. 
So you have a column, you mix it up, and you shut off you, you shut off your mixer and you let it settle, and you measure the the TSS at various periods, and you come up with a distribution function versus settling velocity. And from this, what we can do is, if we know what type of sediments we have, we can predict what the settling velocity is. And in this case, we have this for all of those different, um, all of those different samples, and we were able to come up with a bulk settling velocity for each one of those samples, for the the coarse fraction and for the um, the fine fraction. Now. If you look, this is actually the interface for the sediment transport parameters in the Delft 3D model. And you can see we get, we, we, we're running a sand fraction and a mud fraction. We have density, so we know what the weight is of the sediments. We have the dry bed density. We have the specific density, which is actually the wet density. We have settling velocities. And we have our various erosion parameters. Now, um, we can use all of these based on those sediment samples we took and come up with a model for predicting these things. So now we ran the model, and here it is. Um, we ran the model for three days. Three days is not a lot. Obviously, it's not really even enough for us to, uh, to get a good assessment of sediment transport. But there is a uh, part of this model that we can use because we can put in a morphological factor and what it does is it basically says if you run it for three days what we'll do is we'll just multiply that factor by whatever you want it to be well we can run it with 50 we can run it a hundred times this model was run it 50 times so what you're seeing is we have an accretion of sediments you can see it based on this plot that we're getting you know step functions at each tide because these are all of these are based on the tide, and you're getting sediment washing in and filling up a channel right in the middle of the state channel. Now, if you look at it, it's only going up three millimeters. That's not much. Now, but it's going up three millimeters in a 72-hour period, which, if we did a 50 times morphological factor, that's what the prediction would be for about 150 days. So when you think about it, we're getting a sediment accretion rate of 150 of three millimeters in 150 days. That you can you what you can then do is extrapolate that out and say, okay, well, how often can I come back and actually dredge this channel? Because yeah, three millimeters is not much. But what happens if we have a storm? What happens if you know, how, how many years can this go at three millimeters in 150 days? So, I mean, six millimeters a year or a little, little more than that is nothing. But over time, it will build up. And in some of these channels, you know, there's a significant amount of time between dredging. So how do you go about doing this to actually plan your, your dredging? Now, this is not the highest. Um, accumulation of sediment. Now this is our this is actually showing you where the bed actually changes because these are the depths in the bed, the the different colors. Yellow being the shallow or red being the shallowest, blue being the dark uh, being the deepest. And you can see you don't see a huge change here. Well, it's got to start running. There you go. You don't see a huge change. There's some some shifting of sands around in here. And that's just shoals moving with the real high velocity coming in. But where you actually see a difference, because remember, you're not going to see three millimeters in this in this scale. Where there is a significant change, though, is if you look, you see this shoal. This shoal changes an awful lot during a three-day period. It, it gets pushed around a little bit. Now, if a shoal starts to move, that means that it could end up inside a channel. And because it's you're destabilizing that whole shoal. So that sediment is probably going to change its 
in the way that you can actually um, see the way that it moves. So it's very important to notice these small changes. Now here, what I you can't really see it from what I showed, but if you look at it from here, hold on. Oh, wait, I can't control this, <laughs> sorry. All right, so look at it from the beginning and then Look how it changes over time. It's easier when you look when you move it fast. You can see it the 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 uh, the, high, the 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 ridge of the shoal gets pushed away from the channel. Right, it's getting it's getting pushed outward away from the channel. Now that what's going to happen with that is that is that is an impact of our sediment transport. Now. Some of that sediment is being pushed out this way onto the flat, but some of it is also being suspended and moved around throughout this system. And that's how it's ending up in those channels. And you can see that over these different areas, you can see observation node two is, is by that channel. It actually gets deeper in the channel. Not by much, but it does get deeper. If you look at the other areas though, it's getting, so this sediment is getting pushed and as it gets mobilized, it moves throughout this system. And actually every one of these observation nodes in all of the channels out here, it gets shallower in every single one. The ones in this channel, it gets deeper. So you can see it may even not be a large amount of sediment that's being added to our system. Because remember, this is only three days. We don't have a large uh, erosion upstream that's bringing a lot of mud into the system. This is just sediment that's being suspended and moved around. And it's what it's doing is it's moving itself towards a more natural condition. And the problem is that natural condition is not conducive to um, marine transport. All right, so as I said, this is not a complete project. So we've, we're, we're still working on it. Um, as of right now, what we have is um, a model that is being run. It is accurate for um, water le level water water elevations. We are calibrating with the um, USGS gauge at Shark River, and what we're going to do is we're going to calibrate the hydrodynamics. We cannot necessarily calibrate the sediment transport very well because we only have point measurements during the every the, during the, the the bathymetric surveys that take place every two or three years, and so we're getting those individual points, and we're going to have to run the model between those points. So far, we haven't had the computing uh, resources. We're starting that next next week, so hopefully, we'll be able to run for those two periods. But again, we're going to be fitting to two points, so it. I don't know that I would call that a calibration as a modeler. That's not necessarily satisfying enough to be a calibration. It's probably more of a validation, but the hydrodynamics, we will calibrate with um, the water level elevations. And we also have some current measurements throughout the, throughout the, the, the river that we'll be using as well. Now, the work that is remaining for this, obviously we have to complete the uh, calibration. We need to run long-term model simulations, so we need to run these models for periods of two to three to four years. And then one thing we're doing right now is we we don't expect this period this 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 process to be a very steady process. We expect accretion in state channels to be periodic or episodic, really, and. One of the things that we want to look at is we know Hurricane Sandy dumped huge amounts of sediments throughout the state channels. So we want to run Hurricane Sandy through this model, which we can. We have all of the um, boundary condition data. So we can run Hurricane Sandy and see what happens. How does it move these the sediments around? How does it how does it redistribute sediments throughout this harbor? So that so we're gonna be looking in the long term with our two to three model or two to three year model simulations, but we're also going to look at episodic events and say, okay, well, what would a hundred year storm or a 500 year storm do to sediment transport in this 
in, in this setting. And then again, once that's those are the tasks left for this project, but ultimately we want to incorporate this model into the um, OMR's uh, MAMS model. So we can better manage the sediment the, the, the sediment transport predictions and better manage the resources needed for dredging. Okay. The way that we're going to do that is hopefully we will have um, we're going we're actually getting a whole rack rack server system to be able to run this model on, you know, very large scale for very long periods of time. So that's that's our, that's our next step up in this model. All right, so that's 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 what I have for um, describing this project, and I uh, hand it off to Dan, and I'll answer any questions um, after. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Um, hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen here. Okay, so um, just to continue, I won't take too much of your time. Um, so. Dr. Miskowitz set the stage for trying to understand sedimentation in, in the state navigation channels and um, how fast that happens. And ultimately, we want to know where, where can we put that material? Um, if we can't maintain safe navigation, that's a problem in the state of New Jersey. The, the, the navigation um, system is a huge economic driver for the state. So managing sediments regionally um, is critical. And one of the things that's been happening in recent years and maritime resources and DEP and a lot of the, the other agencies have been working really hard towards what's called beneficial use of dredge material. Um, in a lot of cases, traditional placement sites like confined disposal facilities um, really are not available in certain parts of the state, especially in the upper Barnegat Bay. There are no upland placement sites, traditional sites that have berms and weirs and, and discharge pipes. So one of the things that we've been doing is partnering with uh, the wildlife refuges, in this particular case with the uh, Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, um, in addition to the, um, the consultants working with Maritime Resources, WSP and Gahagan and Bryant, um, to identify places to place material and enhance eroding marshes and beaches within estuaries. Um, me as a geomorphologist and coastal scientist geographer, um, uh, this has extreme interest to me because I'm really interested in the morphodynamics of estuarine beaches. So uh, one of the things that we're trying to understand with this project specifically is near shore placement of sediment. What happens when you place it in the near shore? And how does Again, it change? I'm the sorry, shore? I don't want to interrupt you, but can you uh, remove the box on the screen where your uh, video is showing? It's covering sure. up the PowerPoint a bit. Sorry about that. Yep, got it. Okay. Um, so this project is in Goodluck Point. It's in Berkeley Township, New Jersey. Um, this project is owned by the the, the the land itself is owned by Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. Um, the project area itself, you can see here in the map with the red. Um, it's, it consists of a narrow sandy estuarine beach and dune system fronting a tidal marsh. Now, there it was a second part to this larger Good Luck Point project where they did do a thin layer um, restoration on the other side of the road. Um, but I'll be talking specifically about the near shore placement side of things. So the sandy beach shoreline has been migrating landward, threatening the landward marsh area for several for many years. Um, there are several sand overwash veins that are already overlain on the marsh platform. So the project objectives for this were to do a pre-dredging assessment, uh, calculates and analyzes baseline conditions for turbidity, um, current and wave conditions at the placement site, tracking the extents of any sediment plumes that resulted from the placement operation itself, um, assessment of post placement conditions to determine if the sediment remains as placed or how the morphology of the beach system has changed over time. And then lastly, related to what Dr. Miskowitz was discussing, develop a morphological model to optimize configurations for future placements. So, as I said before, this, this was a near shore placement um, prior to 
to doing this, the, the, the idea would be to dredge channel dredge sediments from nearby state navigation channels that are shoaled in and place that sandy material in a linear bar formation just offshore of the shoreline. Uh, with the idea that uh, natural wave action and, tidal and, and wave motions will essentially uh, promote cross shore transport of the sediment onto the beach and, and, and extend that seaward edge of the shoreline out into the bay. Um, the one thing that we found, and one thing that I'll, I'll describe later, is that the, the longshore transport here is, is pretty predominantly to the south. So, um, I can show you that in the model, but um, the sediment was to be placed hydraulically via discharge pipe um, in the shallow water just off the beach here. So it's 15 foot width crest elevation at uh, elevation 1 NABD 88, 10 to 1 side slopes. Um, so in terms of the amount of material that was placed at Goodluck Point, uh, there was about 6,000 cubic yards of suitable material within the channels identified at the Good Luck Point channel, just to the south of the project area in yellow, and the Berkeley Shores channels here. Um, this dredge material was hydraulically dredged and discharged within the near shore bar. And to give you an idea of what the actual placement project operation looked like, we, as part of our research, we've done, we did drone monitoring. Um, so you can see here, we have our discharge pipe on this barge here, placing the sand in the near shore, and they've already moved from the point all the way around, and they're heading towards this point here, towards the south. So, as far as the project goes for permitting requirements and, and environmental requirements, um, this project consists of three primary stages. Um, and our tasks specifically for monitoring and the research components were task one before dredging. Um, that part consisted of deploying an ADCP co-located with a turbidity sensor um, prior to the dredging project itself. So we can have an understanding of the baseline conditions of just baseline turbidity, but also uh, waves and tidal currents. Um, and then we also have done several UAS surveys and GPS and hydrographic surveys to develop um, elevation models and understand just the orthometric view of what the shoreline looked like prior to the project. Um, the, in addition to that, we also did a benthic community assessment, which I'll show in a moment. So we took three grab samples uh, to look for macro invertebrates, but we also did transects of uh, video footage, which were very difficult. The data collection effort was quite we didn't see much because it is such a turbid environment in Barnegat Bay. Um, so that was how, that was how we really evaluated the poor dredging, you know, preliminary conditions to see if any impacts, negative or positive, to the area would happen as a result of this project. So during dredging, we we kept the turbidity sensor out there, um, and then we also did several days worth of um, UAS visible plume monitoring, and we also took water quality data. Um, so we took water samples during the active dredging so we could compare um, our turbidity transects, which you can see here in the bottom right, and do a regression analysis to identify, um, compare turbidity with um, total suspended solids. Um, so in addition to the imagery of the visible plume and the water quality data, following the project itself, we continue to do the surveying and the monitoring. So we have done, at as of now we've done these three, six, 12 month surveys. We have our final survey coming up in April. Um, that will be the final survey, the 18 month post project. Um, and we're continually doing the aerial surveys with the drone and GPS hydrographic surveys to get the elevation models for volumetric change and the morphologic change monitoring. Um, then we'll also do a final benthograph sample and video collection at that time. Uh, just to give you an idea what the what one of the video transects looks like, it's very hard to see. Uh, you may not be able to see it from home, but sandy bottom just offshore, uh, very sandy, broken shell. Um, it was pretty barren prior to uh, the project. This is in November 2020. Um, this is essentially what the entire bottom looks like, very sandy. So you see sand waves moving along towards the shoreline here.
Now, the preliminary results we have from our turbidity sensor, um, the turbidity sensor and the ADCP were located just offshore, um, right out here, just off the, off the point at Good Luck Point. So, we had a general understanding of the, of the turbidity in the, in, the, in the project area. Now, the preliminary results, and one of the, one of the main things that we were trying to understand is what what are the impacts of a specific dredging project in water placement on sediment plumes? Because sediment plumes can potentially negatively impact uh, benthic communities as well as fish species and its essential fish habitat and submerged aquatic vegetation and the like. So we really wanted to have a good understanding of, you know, what are the ambient conditions? What are just the day-to-day -day conditions of general suspended sediments, turbidity in Barnegat Bay? And then what are the impacts of the dredging activity itself? And one of the interesting things we found was that um, even prior to the project start, um, the blue is the water level in this graph. We deployed the, the turbidity sensor from November 4th um, through the entirety of the project, but this particular uh, deployment was to December 9th. The project itself started on December 2nd, 2020, and it wrapped up December 23rd, 2020. Um, but the interesting thing to note is that the actual turbidity levels were, were actually far higher prior to the project starting. Um, a lot of this has to do with rain events, um, high wind events, creating resuspending sediments um, on, on and finer grain sediments within the water column. Um, so, and you can see just offshore, even though this is really close to the project area, um, the turbidity values went significantly lower um, following or um, prior to the project itself. And then after the project commencement, it really didn't go much, much higher, uh, maybe one day, but this was also as a result of very, very low tides um, in this area. So once you get very low tides, higher winds, you can get um, higher suspended sediment concentrations in those areas as well. Um, so during the period, um, NTU events were, were approximately 10.4 NTU with a maximum of approximately 19.7 NTU. Uh, during active dredging, um, the measurements were um, 13 NTU with a maximum of 32 NTU. So relatively similar to prior the prior dredging um, timeframe. Now, during the actual placement, we also did drone collections, um, trying to map the visible plume. Um, so you can see here in a lot of these pictures, the the set of suspended sediments identified in the aerial photographs and the aerial imagery uh, were really confined to the immediate project area where the placement was going on. Now, one of the things we also did during active dredging, so on December 21st, this image here, we also did um, turbidity transects with a vessel. And then we compared that to uh, water samples that were taken on that same day. Um, so we're able to create a milligrams per liter total suspended solids map um, on this same exact day. So you can see the dredge location here and the dredge location in this map. And again, the sed suspended sediments and the higher concentrations of sed suspended sediments were limited to the um, immediate project area. And within a few hundred feet of the coastline, they go back down to ambient conditions. This green dot is where the ACP and the uh, turbidity sensor were located. Now, in terms of uh, model calibration and understanding what just what the conditions are in this site. So in, in Barnegat Bay, in the upper Barnegat Bay at this location with regards to currents and water levels, um, this is a semi diurnal tide. Um, <coughs> um, the flood tide typically flows north from Barnegat Little Lake Inlet up towards um, Good Luck Point and then reverses on an ebb flow to the south. Um, the direction of flow is fairly uniform throughout the water column. It's two directional. Um, and then the higher flow values were observed during this deployment during storm events. There was also a storm on November 16th, 2020. Um, that's where we observed the, um, the higher flow values. In terms of waves um, for the, the ADCP output, uh, the wave energy in this, in this specific location is pretty limited due to the short fetch and the shallow water. Um, the significant wave heights here are typically on the order of 20 centimeters or less um, with very, very short periods, less than two seconds. Um, under normal conditions, the movement of sediment is typically dominated by shear flow due to the tidal forcing. 
Uh, but during wave events, like coastal storm events, like on the November 16th date um, that we see here, um, the significant wave height reached 50 centimeters with longer periods where that were greater than two seconds. So during those types of events, the wave energy combined with the tidal flow can suspend sediments from the bed, and that can result in erosion and overwash of the beach. Now, the survey results that we found um, at, to date from all the surveys we've conducted, um, what you're seeing here is an elevation change map uh, between November 2020, which was our pre-survey, and January 2021, which is our immediate post. Um, so you can see here, a lot of the sediment that was placed, um, one thing to keep in mind was we did get a Northeast storm it, during this placement operation. Um, so a lot of the sediment that was placed, especially along the point here, was dis was um, distributed offshore or directly into the south. Um, so you can see here immediate pre and post within this near shore berm placement area. The majority of the sediment there was some around the point, but the majority of the sediment had accumulated um, immediately in the southern area. Um, and then one year post placement. In December 2021 from December 20 or November 2020, um, a lot of the sediment still remains in this southern area. But one of the interesting things is due to the northeast events that we uh, that we observed during that time period, we do start to see some overwashes um, of the beach onto the marsh platform as well. There is some sediment still remaining here, but one of the really interesting things is offshore here, you get these sand waves that move in and out of the Toms River. So you can have tremendous amounts of sediment change offshore uh, with very little on the beach. So you can have, you know, on the order of 15,000 yards moving every three months or so um, offshore in this area. And this is predominantly due to sediment moving south from northeast events and then more sediment coming in and filling in these voids um, from the river. So in terms of the, um, the one year placement operations, um, the difference in sediment placed before and after the dredge operation, um, the amount of material that remained in the near shore berm area was only about 1400 cubic yards. Um, keep in mind, there was a major storm event during that placement time. So out of this entire project area, there was 15,000 yards lost. Um, but within this area specifically before and after the project, where there was 1500 yards or so. So about 42% remained of the placement. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, it's funny, three months prior to that, or three months following that um, post survey, uh, there was 189,000 cubic yard gain offshore in the entire project area. And then the near shore berm area actually gained more, about 1200 yards more of sand. Um, and then between the, before dredge, November 2020, and the three month, which was March 2021, um, the project area gained 2,200 cubic yards, and the near shore berm gained about 25, so about 50% of what was placed. Um, and then, interestingly enough, the one year survey, the entire project area, as you can see here, which is what we're seeing here, the entire project area has lost about 7,100 cubic yards, and the near shore berm still remains about 50% of what was placed. Um, and that's just in this berm area. So there, it's not accounting for the overwash fans, which actually we've been finding have been pretty nice foraging areas for shorebirds. So morphologically speaking, the shoreline still has advanced in the southern area, southern 700 feet of this project area. Um, and it has created uh, some newer overwash areas in the back here. Um, just to give you some aerial comparison from the ortho mosaic uh, mapping missions we did with the, with the drones. Um, Starting from left to right, left is November 2020 prior to the project. Um, the next image is from March 2021, three month post placement. Um, so you can see the amount of sediment placed here. Um, you can visually see the shoreline advance in the southern um, you know, quarter of the project area. And then as we move three months into June 2021, a lot of the sediment has started to um, just taper off into the different edges and um, create a smoother slope on the offshore. And then December 2021, you really can't see this bar here, but it is a higher tide, but it's actually much, much shallower in the offshore in the southern portion here. 
Along the northern extent, you do see some sediment accumulation um, in these little uh, beaches here, but there was continued erosion at this one point here. Um, to summarize and conclude this project, the this in terms of turbidity monitoring uh, for permitting requirements and looking at the environmental impacts to the area, um, turbidity sensor measurements show significantly higher uh, NTU values prior to the commencement of the project. Um, there was really high suspended sediment concentrations um, at the project site at the discharge, uh, but they were really limited to the immediate project area and sharply dropped off to ambient conditions within 300 feet of the shoreline. Um, the preliminary data show in terms of survey work that the alongshore sediment transports to the south and about 42% of the material placed at Good Luck Point has remained um, within 12 months post fill. Um, the entire project area, the total loss was 7,100 cubic yards, um, 12 months post fill. Um, and there were similar losses across the entire area were observed between the before and after dredge survey. Um, there was seaward shoreline movement in the southern 715 feet of the project area. And these preliminary results show are suggesting that different nearshore placement configurations, like a feeder beach of some kind, um, in the future may provide longer duration shoreline restoration. Um, and that may also coincide with the timing of navigation channel dredging projects that we're going to be able to predict with our statewide sedimentation model. Um, now to the, the last step of this project is to do our final survey, but also do a morphological model um, so we can optimize future mutual placement configurations. Now we have a, an entire hydrodynamic model for Barnegat Bay. Um, so here's our project area. So one of the things that we're doing right now um, in this project wrapping up this summer is we're going to be taking and taking these water level observation points and forcing a model at Good Luck Point to optimize and do different placement configurations. So what you're seeing now is water levels blue, blues being um, shallower, green meaning deeper. Uh, but we can take those water level forcings and winds and waves that we ran and force it at Good Luck Point itself and get the velocities and sediment transport in this specific area. And now one of the nice things with the Del 3D model that we can do is actually we can actually simulate a dredge pipe and placement of sediment within the system itself. So we can actually compare and validate our model based on what was placed uh, in our survey data. So one of the nice things is each one of these red arrows represents a date of placement um, for the dredge. And now we can actually start to look at what we're seeing now is the suspended mud concentration. So not only can we compare the extent of a sediment plume, so they start dredging right now. So not only can we compare the extent of a sediment plume from what we observed, now we can also start to track and validate the, the volume of material that was placed from the dredging operation um, to the model. So now we can start to look at different placement areas. So not only can we just take these arrows and place them along here, but now we can start to take, you know, maybe one location and create a feeder beach here and then look at that distribution of sediment. Uh, this model, I only ran for a week. Um, I'm gonna be running it for the entire project time frame um, in the next day or two. But as you can see here, um, dredging starts uh, around the end of December 2nd, right in this location. You can start to see this is the bed level. So darker blues mean deeper, green means um, shallower or above water. Um, but it's kind of hard to see, but you can start to see these cells filling up in the near shore bar area as a result of the placement. So if I just go a little faster, you can start to see placement of the sediment in the near shore. And we can run this for a long time. So the idea is we're just like we're doing for the Shark River project, we're gonna be running this for 18 months. So we're gonna do the placement and try to validate the model based on what was placed and then what the sediment does over the term of the 18 month period. So we can um, really validate our model. And then the next step would be just to take those configurations and see what happens if we place sediment right here, where does it go? Um, what happens if we place it over here, or we instead of a linear bar, what happens if we do um, some type of breakwater offshore? So these are the types of things that we're starting to look at 
um, this project specifically should be wrapping up, but one of the more powerful things we've uh, we've observed uh, for this approach is that now we can start to do this before the project even starts. So now we can start to optimize placement before we even go to the planning phase or in the planning phase before design. And this can really help inform design for coastal resiliency projects, um, optimizing dredging timeframes and placement timeframes as well and permitting times. So a uh, really powerful project and um, I hope to give another presentation once we wrap this up um, future. Uh, and that's it. Omid, I'll hand Great. it off to you. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, we've got quite a few questions in here and I'm gonna answer them as they came in. So I think we're gonna be starting with uh, with Robert. Um, scrolling back here. Uh, for the shear samples, Robert, um, did freezing the cores impact the shear measurement? Um, they may have. Uh, the reason we froze them was because, um, frankly, we didn't want anything to grow. These are the yeah. samples are pretty much alive. Um, and if we had been able to analyze them right when we went out on the samples, which actually we did the samples in two different um, two different cruises. The first cruise we froze them. The second cruise they were fresh, and we had actual graduate students on campus at that point. So we ran our measurements then. So those were not actually frozen. Um, but the problem was if we left them in the fridge, they would actually start growing roots. So we had we had to freeze them. Um, it probably did have some impact depending on the texture and how organic the uh, the samples were. But um, I, yeah, I, I would, to, if we were doing it again, probably wouldn't say I wouldn't freeze them, but since we had to, we took a bunch of samples and we weren't going to be running them for months. Um, we, we had to, unfortunately. Uh, and in so situ is in situ is very hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and these samples, uh, I mean, a lot of them were, you know, they would have, they would have algae growing straight up out of them. So, sure. you know, getting a truly in situ sample, as Dan said, is impossible. Uh, also, you mentioned a bridge at Highland Avenue. Uh, the question was, is your model picking up the velocity changes of depth from the water from shallow to deep? And would the sediment be more from the side slopes caving in? So, I think um, the question, is it a 3D model? It's, is that the question? I'm assuming it's yeah, I'm looking at layering of, all, of, of right. the water column. And this is a depth averaged model. Uh, as far as uh, you said, you were going to uh, do a simulation of something like Hurricane Sandy. How do you uh, plan on doing the simulation of an extreme weather event? Well, we have the um, as long as we have the boundary conditions, um, we can run the model because um, the model itself is going to be driven by the water levels out in the ocean, which we have those measurements. Those are th those measurements were taken. We also have. The measurements in the shark river inlet so we if we can't get the ocean ones we can use that as a boundary condition we also have the usgs gauges now some of them went offline so we might have to you know do some interpolation but that type of that type of simulation is just going to be done based on adjusting the boundary conditions the wind may have a little bit of an impact on this but probably not as much as the as as the uh the water level going up. So, I mean, the real impact to sediment transportation transport in this in Sandy during this type of uh, event is everything was inundated and then it all washed out. And when it washes mm -hmm. out, it carried all kinds of stuff with it. So it's really right. the the release afterwards that causes the huge amount of uh, erosion and infilling of the channel. So we can, as long as we have that sequence. Um, we'll be able to come up with some pretty good uh, simulations. Of the okay. And uh, one last question for you. Uh, does the popularity of the channel factor into the frequency or the priority of dredging, i.e. the Shark River main state channels versus the upper reaches of state channels further west in the Shark River inlet? 
that front along residential areas. The um, you're asking how they actually decide what channels to dredge, right? Yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, that's that awesome. is. That's a Scott that question. Is, just... That is a question for OMR, not for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do know that it is based on many, many, many things of which I'm not qualified to comment on. It is, it is, it is on condition, but it's also on need. It's also on the many other things that drive decisions in the New Jersey Department of Transportation, which many of the people sitting on here would know better than I. All right, and uh, Dan, uh, was the project uh, permitted as a pilot project or did it not have that designation? Uh, I don't believe it had that no. designation because it was- No, it wasn't a pilot. No, it's part of, so the nice thing that that, uh, that OMR was able to do is partnering with Forsyth. So it's technically a Forsyth project uh, by the Federal mm -hmm. Wildlife Refuge. Um, and then NJDOT is partnering with them to provide the material um, and a lot of the technical resources to do it. Okay. And uh, as far as your modeling, how uh, how do you go about testing the accuracy of the modeling of your preliminary model? So that's a good question. So we have survey data. So one of the things we're going to be able to do since the morphological model is we're going to be comparing the survey data with the model output. So that time varying bed level I showed you. So that's one of the ways we're going to be validating it. But also we have the ADCP data. Um, so mm -hmm. in terms of validating, we can validate the velocities and the water levels from the ADCP. And there's also a tide gauge um, very close to there because we're forcing the, the our project grid with a larger model from Barnegat Bay that's used with um, forcing from the out from the ocean. Okay, and this one, uh, it could be for either of you, but uh, in, in the locations that you chose, Shark River and, and Good Point, were, were there other locations in New Jersey that you identified as areas that you could also do similar observations? Like, do you have other locations that you're looking at? Oh, yeah, <laughs> lots and lots. Oh, man, our plan is actually to do this for the entire state navigation channel. So, okay. yes to everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's and in terms of good luck points specifically, um, it, in my observation, marshes aren't getting bigger. <laughs> so, and, and beaches um, continually need sediment um, in, because there's lack of sediment supply due to the amount of development in New Jersey. So, uh, yes, there's a lots of areas that could use this type of uh, work. And we have we have a couple of projects coming up at locations in in this area and further south that are going to be get similar treatment. All right, uh, we are all out of time and all out of questions. Uh, I want to thank you both again. Uh, your presentations were wonderful, and those presentations will be posted on the NJDOT Technology Transfer website. The link is shared there on the screen. Uh, we're going to send out a notice to everyone who registered when the presentations are posted and how to access the certificates for continuing education credit. And uh, please complete, complete the feedback form at the end of the event when it's sent to you. Uh, again, thank you very much to both of you. And uh, please look forward to our next presentation. Uh, the next lunchtime tech talk is going to be April 21st. And the information is there. Take care, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one.